don't doubt the value of meditation or underestimate your abilities. Be content with whatever progress you make, because it reflects a part of the truth you are seeking. As such, it is something you can rely on. Blessing of a Lifetime Ajahn Sao spent three years living in the vicinity of Ban Hue Sai village, first in one forest location, then in another. By the time he departed Kam Chai district and wandered north, the religious landscape in the area had been altered for good. So influential was Ajahn Sao that most of the locals now favored Buddhist practices over spirit worship. Dapai's father had accompanied Ajahn Sao as he moved to different places in the area, suggesting new secluded spots and working with his friends to construct small bamboo shelters for him and his disciples. As much as anyone, he was pleased by the Buddhist renaissance spreading through the community. While Tabai's father was saddened to see Ajahn Sao leave, he was simultaneously consoled by his knowledge that Buddhism was now firmly established in the hearts and minds of his Buddhai neighbors. Little did he suspect, though, that Ajahn Sao's departure would be succeeded by the arrival of the most revered Buddhist master of them all. Ajahn Man Puri Tato was a legend in the making. The story of his life and spiritual attainments were to gain an exalted status unparalleled in modern Thai history. Already his sterling reputation had reached the northeastern provinces, passed on by word of mouth throughout the region. It was said that he expounded the profound nature of Tamma with such power and persuasion that even the spirits were subdued in his presence. Devas, Nagas, Garudas, and Asuras were all captivated by the aura of his abiding love and compassion. His austere way of life had made him a master of the ascetic, a pioneer of the Dutanga lifestyle. His disciples, the monks who lived by his example, had become his legion, and he guided them with the uncompromising discipline of a consummate spiritual warrior. It was rumored that by meeting a John Mun only once, one would be bestowed with a lifetime of good fortune. A true wanderer, a John Mun rarely stayed in the same location for more than one rains retreat. After the rains ended, he and his monks roamed freely, unburdened, through the vast northeastern wilderness, like birds at ease, flying peacefully to wherever the wind took them, like birds who soar freely and are content to land in a tree, pond, or marsh, then to fly off and leave all behind with no lingering attachment, so too did Dutunga monks lead lives of sublime detachment. Thus, in 1917, as the annual monsoon season was fast approaching, a John Mun and a group of sixty monks wandered down from the north to arrive in the wooded foothills overlooking the village of Ban Hue Sai. They camped under trees, in caves, under overhanging cliffs, and in nearby charnel grounds. Following Ajahn Sao's groundbreaking path into the Ban Hue Sai community, Ajahn Mun's arrival caused a stir of excitement. The villagers were thrilled with the prospect of making merit by supporting monks. The entire village of Ban Hue Sai welcomed the Tamma monks with faith and gratitude. Ajahn Mun and his disciples took up their practice in their new surroundings, living simply and practicing meditation in the Dutanga tradition. Many villagers flocked to the hillside encampment on lunar observance days, and Tapai's parents made sure to join them. At that time, Tapai was hardly aware of Ajahn Mun's distinguished reputation. She had heard his name mentioned in connection with Ajahn Sao. The two had long been close spiritual companions, supporting and encouraging each other in the way of practice. That much Tapai knew, but little else. Accompanying her parents from time to time, she noticed differences between Ajahn Mun and Ajahn Sao. She saw at once that a John Mun's forceful, dynamic character contrasted sharply with a John Sao's serene and even temperament. Physically, a John Mun was shorter and more slender than a John Sao, but when he spoke, he was much more active. His arms flew, his hands gestured dramatically, and his voice thundered. Tapai felt a little afraid of a John Mun at first, a little wary of his intensity. In the village, each morning, as she placed offerings of food in his alms bowl, Ajahn Mun frequently stopped and addressed her directly, encouraging her to come see him more often. But, feeling shy and timid in his presence, Tapai only dared to go on special religious days when she was with her parents and a group of the local villagers. Ajahn Mun was always exceptionally kind to her, 
often recognizing her presence on observance days and exchanging a few words with her. Knowing intuitively that she possessed uncommon spiritual potential and deep devotion, he began encouraging her to do meditation. He explained to her the same basic technique that Ajahn Sao had taught, silent repetition of the meditation word Bhutto, practiced repeatedly and continuously until it became the sole object of her awareness. He emphasized that mindfulness, being mindful and aware only of the moment-to-moment -moment recitation of each syllable, Bhutto, Bhutto, must be present to direct her efforts. It would make her alert and fully attentive to the rise and fall of each repetition. A simple method, she thought, but, due to instinctive modesty, she hesitated taking it up at first. As a John Mun repeatedly insisted that she try meditation practice, Tabai began to suspect that she must possess some inherent ability. She thought to herself, I am just an ordinary village girl, but I must have some inherent virtue. Why else would he show such an interest in me? From now on, I should take his advice and try to practice meditation in the way he has so kindly taught me. One evening, after dinner, Tapai readied herself and went to her bedroom early. All day she had felt a willful determination welling up inside her heart. Today was the day to focus her full attention on the repetition of Bhutto, just as a John Mun had taught her. With devotion and a serious sense of purpose, Dabai began to mentally repeat the meditation word Bhutto. After about fifteen minutes of steady, deliberate recitation, her conscious mind suddenly dropped down to the heart and converged into a profound state of quiet stillness. It was as though she had instantly fallen to the bottom of a well, where her body and mind vanished into silence. The experience was so new and so extraordinary that she had no idea what had happened to her. After a brief time, her mind withdrew slightly from deep samadhi, and she became uncomfortably aware of an image of her body lying dead in front of her. She recognized her own corpse very clearly. The image was so real and so vivid in detail that it convinced her she must have died. Suddenly, seemingly out of nowhere, an anxious thought ruffled the calm. Since I'm dead, who'll take my place cooking rice to put into the monk's bowls tomorrow? Who's going to tell a John Mun that I died sitting in meditation tonight? Quickly suppressing these worries, Tapai steadied her mind and accepted her fate. She mused, If I'm dead, I'm dead. Everyone in the world is bound to die. Nobody can escape from death. Even a great king must die one day. Her mind then became resolute and focused as she fixed her attention to the dead body lying prostrate before her. The image had not faded or changed in the least, which reinforced her impression that she was actually dead. As she pondered the consequences of her death without reaching any conclusions, a small group of local villagers appeared in her vision. They simply materialized in the picture, slowly picked up her limp, lifeless body, and carried it to a nearby charnel ground. As the villagers laid her body in the middle of the desolate area, she noticed a John Mun and a group of monks solemnly walking toward the corpse. A John Mun stopped in front of it and gazed down for a moment before turning to the monks to say, This girl is dead. Now I'll perform the funeral rites. As the monks looked on impassively, heads slightly bowed, a John Mun softly intoned the funeral chant. Anita Vata Sankara. When the components that make up the body have died, the body is no longer of use. The heart, however, does not die. It goes on working ceaselessly. When it develops in the way of virtue, its benefits are unlimited. But if it is used in harmful ways, it becomes a danger to oneself. With calm deliberation, Ajahn Man slowly repeated this dictum three times in succession. Standing tall and perfectly still, except for the movement of his arm, he tapped her corpse three times with his walking stick, declaring with each tap, The body does not last. Having been born, it must die. The heart, however, does last. It is never born, and it does not die when the body dies. 
it is constantly in motion, spinning and shifting, following the causes and conditions that lead it on. Continuing to tap the corpse rhythmically with the tip of his walking stick, Ajahn Mun appeared to reiterate this truth over and over again. With each gentle tap of his stick, her body started to decompose. First the skin blistered and peeled, exposing the flesh beneath. Further tapping rotted the flesh and sinews, revealing the bones and inner organs. Entranced, Tapai watched passively as her entire body quickly decayed until only the hard bones remained intact. Placing his hand in the skeletal debris and picking up the kernel of the heart in his palm, Ajahn Mun announced, The heart can never be destroyed. If it were destroyed, you would never regain consciousness. Tapai witnessed the unfolding of the entire scene with a mixture of awe and trepidation. She was not sure how to understand it. When Ajahn Mun finished speaking, she puzzled, If the whole body decomposes at death, leaving only the bones behind, what is it that regains consciousness? Still looking at the colonel in his hand and without lifting his gaze, Ajahn Mun immediately answered her thought. It's bound to return. How could you not regain consciousness when the kernel that brings it back is still there? You will regain consciousness tomorrow morning at dawn. Tapai spent the entire night seated in meditation, completely absorbed in the vision of her dead body. Only at the first light of dawn did her mind withdraw from deep samadhi. As she was becoming aware of herself, she looked down at her body seated on the bed. She realized, with a sigh of relief, that she had not died. Her normal waking state had returned, and she felt pleased to be alive. But then, as she pondered the night's events, she began to chide herself for falling asleep and dreaming throughout the night when she should have been meditating instead. She was sure that a John Mun would be disappointed with her. Later in the morning, a John Mun passed by her house on his daily alms round. As Tapai placed food in his alms bowl, he looked at her quizzically. Then he smiled and told her to come see him when he had finished eating. Her father accompanied her on the familiar walk to a John Mun's encampment, unsure why she was asked to go. Could there be a problem? Tapai walked silently, brooding and feeling ashamed of herself for falling asleep in meditation. What was she going to tell a John Mun? Certainly he'd be displeased. She wanted to hide, but she didn't know where or how. As soon as they entered the encampment, Tapai mumbled some excuse to her father and rushed off to help the womenfolk fetch water at the stream. Seeing Tasoan approaching alone, Ajahn Mun looked surprised and asked him for Tapai's whereabouts. Tasoan then quickly fetched his daughter from the stream. Nervous and uneasy, Tapai crawled to where Ajahn Mun was seated and bowed down three times before him. Immediately, before she had time to draw a breath, he asked her, How was your meditation last night? Timidly and awkwardly, she replied, It was just hopeless, sir. After repeating Butto for about fifteen minutes, I felt my mind drop down a deep well. After that I fell asleep and dreamed all night long. When I awoke at dawn, I was so disappointed with my meditation that I still can't get over it. I'm really worried you'll scold me for my lack of effort. Upon hearing this, Ajahn Mun laughed with joy and asked her straight away, How did you sleep? And what did you dream? Please, tell me about it. When she told him what had happened, he roared with laughter. Delighted by her story, he said, That was not sleep. You were not dreaming. What you experienced was the calm, integrated state called Samadhi. Remember this well. What you thought was a dream was really a vision arising spontaneously from the deep concentration of Samadhi. If you have any further experiences of this kind, just relax and allow them to happen. There is no need to be worried or frightened. I don't want you to be afraid, but you must remain alert and fully aware of whatever takes place in your meditation. As long as I am living here, no harm will come to you. But from now on, Please come and tell me about the visions that you experience in your meditation.